So now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Andrew Peregrine. He is a veterinarian and clinical parasitologist at the Ontario Veterinarian College at the University of Guelph. He obtained his DMV and PhD from the University of Glasgow, Scotland. His research interests currently include emerging parasite infections of animals and people and drug resistance in paras parasites of dogs and sheep. He's a diplomate of the European Veterinarian Parasitology College, whew, that's a bit of a tongue twister, and the American College of Veterinarian Microbiologists. So thank you, Andrew, so much for, for agreeing to do this presentation tonight. Oh, is there anything I need to do to switch? Let me, let me try. I think I, okay, I'll do it. Is that okay? Yes, perfect. Is that, can you see full screen now, Kristen? I, I can, yes. That's great. Okay, Kristen, thanks very much. Joel, thank you also as well. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and thanks for coming along this evening. Um, as Kristen mentioned, I, or she didn't actually give the year, I actually came to Canada to teach at the Ontario Veterinary College um, in 1997. By the way, a quick reminder as we go through this, if you have any questions, as, we, as was already mentioned, please feel free just to send them by the chat feature and I'll get interrupted as we go along and then there'll be the opportunity for asking questions at the end. As I said, I came to Canada and the Ontario Vet College in Guelph in 1997. And this is true, when I turned up, I asked the person I was replacing who was retiring at that time, I said to them, what do you teach the vet students about ticks in Ontario? And he literally said to me, you don't need to bother, ticks are not an issue. <clears throat> and that, on, in all honesty, was what I was told in 1997. What I want to talk to you about this evening is tell you what's been happening in Ontario since basically the year I arrived. A lot has been happening with respect to ticks and particularly <clears throat> the risk of Lyme disease. So the things I wanted to cover this evening, number one is just make sure that not only are you aware of what ticks you can find on yourself and your pets, but also what bugs can they, those ticks can transmit to you uh, and your pets. Um, I wanna tell you how things have changed since I've been here. I'll also tell you what we think is gonna change in the next 10 years. By far the most common and important tick-borne disease is Lyme disease. And so much of the focus will be about that particular disease. I should mention I'm a veterinarian. Um, I, I've, Legally, I'm allowed to talk about anything other than people. Um, however, you can't talk about Lyme disease without talking about the disease in people. And so I will come to that a number of times. I want to show you with data that's been shared with me by the Public Health Agency of Canada and others, show you the ways the risk of Lyme disease not only has changed in the last 20 years, how, but how we think it's going to change in the coming years. And to understand how it's going to change, you need to understand the role of wildlife um, in the life cycle of the tick that's associated with Lyme disease. And the last thing I'm going to finish off by doing is saying, what can you do both for yourself and your pets if there's any concern about Lyme disease? Not only what can you do to reduce the risk of Lyme disease in your pet, but what can you do to reduce the risk of getting Lyme disease in yourself? We'll also talk a little bit about the disease in people. Um, so that you understand how it typically initially appears. So this, this is the first picture I was going to show you, and it's a picture taken in the inside of an ear of a dog that lives, lives actually in the Guelph area. And my question, if I was standing in front of you, is what is this? If you can all see it, it's attached to the ear of this dog. Hopefully you can all recognize it's a tick, and the way to make sure you know it's a tick is to answer, answer the two questions. Number one, can you see it with your eyes without a microscope? So if you can see it with your eyes, and if you can count the pairs of legs, and it comes to four pairs of legs, which is what this creature has. It is, so if it's got four pairs of legs and you can see it, it must be a tick. All right, so hopefully you can all recognize that. Next question I was going to ask you, and this is relevant when we start talking about the risk of Lyme disease, is that a freshly attached tick or has it been feeding a long time? Hopefully you'll understand by the end of this talk that that tick has only just started feeding and there's much more risk 
of getting Lyme disease from the relevant tick if it's fed for a long time. Now, when I first came to Canada in 1997, there was only one tick that we ever saw on people and pets in Southern Ontario. And so there really wasn't any need to identify the tick because essentially it was always the same tick. However, it's since the mid 1990s that another tick, the deer tick has appeared in Ontario. And I want to make sure that not only do you know what you're dealing with a tick, but you know which tick you're dealing with because it's only one tick that we find on ourselves today in Southern Ontario. It's only one of them that's associated with the risk of Lyme disease. So before I get to the two ticks we see commonly in Ontario today, I just wanna make sure that you're aware that if you go into the textbooks, if you go online and look for what ticks can you find on people and pets in North America, this is actually the list of the most common ticks that you can find on people and pets right across North America. The left-hand column gives the common name, the right-hand column gives the scientific name. Now there is a total of seven, but the reality today in Southern Ontario is that there are essentially only two ticks we typically find on people and our pets. The first indicated by a blue arrow is the American dog tick, and that's the tick we think we always had in Ontario. So when I came here in 1997, that was the only tick that was here. The other tick that's appeared in Ontario and changed its distribution dramatically over the last 25 years is the deer tick, or Ixodes scapularis. So if you ever find a tick on yourself at the moment or your pet, it's most likely it's one of those two, and I want to make sure that you can differentiate those two by looking at it. I'm gonna show you how to do this. If you're not confident by the end of this talk, you, you should be feel free to go into your public health unit or your local veterinarian because they should also have this information in a form um, that you can take away. So this is a, these are two pictures of the two common ticks that we find today in Southern Ontario uh, on people and our pets. I'm showing you pictures of unfed ticks because it's much easier to show you how to identify them before we look at ticks that are well fed on people. And the first thing to ask yourself when you're looking at ticks is look at the structure and I've put an arrow beside the structure that lies behind the, the um, mouth parts at the front end of the tick. The arrow is pointing to the edge of the plate or the scutum and that structure is behind the mouth parts of the tick. And the question to ask yourself is if you look at that plate, if you look at it entirely, is it all dark brown or is it multicolored? So look at that plate and look at those two ticks. And if you look at the one on the left, the one that the arrow is pointed to, the question is, is that plate all dark brown or multicolored? Hopefully you appreciate it's multicolored. As soon as you see it's multicolored, you know it has to be the American dog tick. That's the common name we use. The scientific name is Dermacenter variabilis. That's the American dog tick. And in this province, that's a really good tick to find because it doesn't transmit anything nasty to people or pets. All right, so there are no nasty diseases associated with that tick in Ontario. So remember, the American dog tick is the multicolored, or what we say is an ornate plate or a scutum. Let's now look at the tick on the right. And the arrow again points to the edge of that plate. And now I'm asking you again, is that all dark brown or is it multicolored? And hopefully by comparing it to the tick on the left, you can appreciate that the plate or the scutum on the tick on the right is all dark brown. And essentially, if you're in Ontario and you find a tick like that on yourself or your pets, it really has to be the deer tick. It's also sometimes called the black leg tick, but most people know it as the deer tick. And its scientific name is Ixodes scapularis. The important thing to appreciate, the tick on the right, the deer tick, that's the tick that when it feeds can transmit the bug that causes Lyme disease onto people. And the name of the bug that causes Lyme disease is given there. The name is Borrelia burgdorferi. It's a bacterial infection that's associated with this particular tick. So there's only a concern about the risk of Lyme disease if you find a deer tick or a black leg tick on yourself. A little bit about the bug that causes Lyme disease. This is um, two pictures of the bug 
taken on a very high powered electron microscope. It's just a bacteria, so you need high magnification to see it. The name is Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, and the disease it causes is called Lyme disease. And if I was in a room with you, I would ask you, why is it called Lyme disease? And the reason is the first description of this disease was in an area in Connecticut called Lyme. So that's where the name comes from. And all the evidence is, looking at museum specimens in the Connecticut area, this bug and this tick has been in the Connecticut area for at least the last 100 years. So that's where it gets the name Lyme disease from. Now, what I've just shown you are two ticks that had not fed. So I'd not shown you two ticks that had not fed. The reality is certainly with our pets, we usually don't find ticks on our pets until they've been feeding for a long time. And so it's important that you can recognize those ticks as well. So this is the first of the ticks, the two I've just shown you, but the one that takes up most of that screen, that tick has been attached to the skin of a dog for a long time. It's a female tick, and the reason she's feeding on the dog is because she needs blood to produce eggs. So her body is greatly dilated as she's been ingesting blood, and that's so that she can produce eggs. The way you identify the tick is exactly the same as before. Don't let the enlarged body throw you. Look at the structure, the plate that's right behind the mouth parts. The mouth parts now are stuck inside the skin of the dog. Look at the plate right behind that. And again, the question is, is that plate all dark brown or is it multicolored? Is it all dark brown or is it multicolored? Hopefully, you can appreciate that the plate that arrow is pointing to, if you look at it, it's multicolored. And so it has to be the American dog tick. So if you pull that tick off yourself or a pet and someone says to you, is there a risk of Lyme disease from that tick? The answer is categorically no. There's no risk of Lyme disease from that tick. So it effectively is a good tick, although I appreciate the aesthetics of having a tick hanging off you uh, is not much fun. For those of you who've never had a tick feeding on you before, just so that you know, when ticks typically attach to us or our pets, they use an anesthetic um, so that we usually don't feed, feel them feeding. And by this stage, when they're well engorged, they've often produced a cement that anchors them to the skin. And that's why removing them can be a challenge. I'll come back to that a little bit later. So that's the first of the two ticks that's well engorged. Hopefully you can now recommend it, you recognize it. This is the other tick. And again, a, a first question, has it fed? So the answer is yes, that body is enlarged greatly, but focus on the plate or the scutum at the front. And again, the question is, is it all dark brown or is it multicolored? Is it all dark brown or multicolored? Hopefully you appreciate by comparison to the other one, that's all dark brown. So essentially in Ontario, that has to be the deer tick. So let me tell you a few things about the deer tick or the black leg tick. This shows you two pictures of two, two of these ticks that have not fed. Just to remind you again, just keep looking at the plates behind the mouth parts. You can see they're all dark brown. I'll just indicate the tick on the right has crawled up um, a blade of grass, and that's where they usually are when we come in contact with them. They usually have crawled up blades of grass, and they're typically at our knee or slightly lower than our knee height. And if you look at the mouth parts of, of that tick, just behind that, the two front legs are pointing out, and they're literally just waiting for us or our pets to walk by, and that's how they attach to us. And I'll come back to that in a minute. The important thing to appreciate, as I've already said, this is the tick in Ontario that transmits the bug that causes Lyme disease. It actually also transmits another bug called anaplasma that causes another disease, both in people and in pets. It's much less common in Ontario ticks than Borrelia burgdorferi, but it is in the ticks as well. So I think the obvious question is, how long have we had this tick in Ontario and where is it now and where is it going to establish? 
It's important that you understand the life cycle of this tick, what it needs in its environment for it to both establish and then to spread. As most of you on this call um, will be interested in the Long Point area and Lake Erie. Just to give you some background, until the mid 1990s, Long Point on Lake Erie was the only place in all of, not only Ontario, but all of Canada that, that, that this tick occurred. So until the mid 1990s, the only place in Canada where the deer tick occurred was Long Point on Lake Erie. It's since that time that it's spread, not only within Ontario, in other parts of Canada, and it's continuing to spread. And as I said, to understand where it can spread to, you need to understand what it needs in its environment to establish and multiply. So it's called the deer tick because adult ticks typically feed on deer, especially white-tailed deer. And so that's where adult ticks feed. And as I mentioned, adult ticks need blood to produce eggs. Once the tick is fully engorged on the tip deer, and it's typically white-tailed deer, that tick drops off into the environment, right? And that's a pick, the, the arrow now points to the adult tick that's fully fed, she's dropped off into the environment. Just so that you know, if a tick like that drops off into an ha indoor household environment, we do not have the right humidity and temperature typically, but particularly humidity, we don't typically have the right humidity in the indoor environment for any of the eggs to survive or the tick to survive. For the tick and particularly the eggs to survive, it needs to be in an outdoor environment as do all of the life cycle stages. And it needs to be typically in vegetation that's associated with deciduous forests. Because at the bottom of that, it's the correct humidity and other environmental conditions for those eggs that the tick has laid to mature into the next life cycle stage. So after the tick has laid the eggs into a suitable outdoor environment, the eggs hatch, as is indicated by the moving arrow, and out of those eggs hatches a tiny little microscopic, it's almost microscopic, you can just see it, it's called a larva. They're tiny, as I'll show you in a minute, we rarely ever see them, but they are in the environment. And when they've hatched out of the eggs, those larval ticks need to feed on blood. And the blood they particularly prefer to feed on is the blood typically of wild rodents and especially white-footed mice in Southern Ontario. And I'll tell you the role of white-footed mice in the life cycle of this parasite actually in a second. It's important to appreciate that I, as I tell you about this tick, once the tick gets infected with the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, the tick remains infected for life. So let me just say that again. Once the tick gets infected with the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, it remains infected for life. So when that Andrew, adult tick, yes? Sorry, don't, uh, just to interrupt you there. Uh, a great question in the chat room. Um, how many eggs are laid each time? That's a great question. How many eggs are laid each time? So the, the adult tick lays all the eggs at once um, that it's going to produce, and it usually lays many thousands into its environment. But that just happens once, uh, and then the adult tick essentially dies. As I said, thanks for that question. Once those eggs hatch, that larva um, hatches out of them. Now, as I mentioned, once a tick is infected, it remains infected for life. However, when that adult tick that's infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease, once it produces its eggs, it does not pass the bacteria infection onto the eggs. So all the eggs that hatch, that are produced by an infected adult tick, all of the larvae that hatch out of those eggs, they're clean. They're not infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. So the obvious question is, well then how do they get infected? And the answer to that lies in the role that white-footed mice play. Because white-footed mice quite commonly get infected with the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. It doesn't make them typically sick, but it circulates in their blood. So the bacteria is in the blood of the white-footed mice, and the larvae that have hatched out of the eggs preferentially attach to these types of small rodents, 
They're feeding on the mouse to get blood, but if there's bacteria in that blood, then the larva gets infected with the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And once the tick is infected, so if a larva remains infect, gets infected with the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, it remains infected for the rest of its life. Now, I said that the larva feeds on mice because it needs blood. And so it needs blood to mature. Once it's fully fed, that larva drops back on into the outdoor environment. And again, if the conditions are right in the environment, it's, um, it molts to what we call the nymph stage. And the nymph stage, just like the larval stage, preferentially feeds on wild rodents, particularly white-footed mice. And why is that of advantage to the bug that causes Lyme disease? Because if the larva happens to feed on mice that are not infected, the nymph that results from that is not infected. However, it's also feeding on white-footed mice. And so if it feeds on an infected mouse, it then gets infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. And so it remains infected for life. So the feeding of both the larva and the nymph, particularly on white-footed mice, uh, maximizes the chance of the tick getting infected. Once the nymph is fully fed on a white-footed mouse or other rodent, it drops back off into the environment and it molts into the immature adult and then that climbs up the blades of grass, waiting for you, dogs or deer, to walk by. Let me give you some indication of the size of those different life cycle stages. And this was taken by a colleague working in um, Eastern Ontario. So this shows you the different life cycle stages by comparison to an adult's thumb. The arrow is pointing to the larva. That's what hatches out of the eggs. And I think you'll appreciate it's very unlikely you'd ever see it. Not only is it tiny, but it primarily feeds on wild rodents. And so we almost never see these. Once the larva has fed and molts, it develops into a nymph and an unfed nymph is shown there. Now this primarily feeds on wild rodents. However, it does sometimes feed on people. And the general feeling is about 50% of all the Lyme disease cases in humans um, in, in this part of North America is actually associated with the feeding of nymphs. However, once the nymph has fed and it drops off into the environment, it molts to adults, and th those are pictures of unfed adult deer ticks. All right, they're not particularly large. Once they've started feeding, they become a lot larger. So, a few important things just to appreciate about what the different life cycle stages feed on. And I want to indicate something I've not mentioned so far. I mentioned the stage that hatches out of the eggs, the larva primarily feed on wild rodents, especially white-footed mice. And that's why in the brackets, I've already put shrews and voles. It's really important to know that larva will also feed on birds. And I'll come back to the relevance of that in a second. Once the larva molts, it develops into a nymph. And as I said, that feeds on essentially the same thing, wild rodents. It also will feed on birds. So both larva and nymphs will feed on birds. And like any tick, when it attaches to anything, typically they are attached for a number of days. And so if a larva or if a nymph starts feeding on a bird, and so that's typically a ground dwelling blur, bird, because the ticks don't climb trees, they're in the upper parts often of grass, if they attach to birds and then the bird takes off for a flight, the tick literally goes with the bird wherever it flies to. And the relevance of that is what happens every spring when birds migrate from the northeastern seaboard of the US into Canada. They bring large numbers of these ticks every spring with them. They're either larva or they're nymphs that have attached to those birds. Okay, another you... question for you. Uh -huh. Um, can an infected nymph transfer the infection to a previously non-infected mouse? So could, so could the nymph transmit the infection to a non-infected mouse? Absolutely. And that's probably how most of them get infected. So that's a good question. Thanks for that. Finally, adult ticks typically are found on white-tailed deer, all right? Um, and in addition to dogs and people, you will occasionally find them on coyotes. I think it's important just to go back, I just want to go back to the life cycle, 
Just to point out one thing with this life cycle, I think when you look at that life cycle, you appreciate that deer are very important in the life cycle. The question I often get asked is, does that mean that if deer are not in your area, you can't have this tick? The answer actually is no, that's not true. There is a park in New York City where this tick has established quite happily and there are no deer. The reason the tick has established in that park is that the adults have learned to feed on rats. It's not a perfect environment for the tick, but they do survive in that environment. But if you have white-tailed deer if your environment, the tick does an awful lot better. Um, because everything is then perfect for the life cycle. The last thing just to make you uh, understand is the typical environment where all these different life cycle stages um, develop best. It's typically on the vegetation on the edge or within deciduous forests. So it's typically vegetation on the edge of or within deciduous forests where these ticks survive best. And so this is a picture of a typical environment just to remind you, the ticks that are going to attach to you typically are crawled up blades of grass and they're waiting for you. So even if you know the ticks are in a particular forest environment, if you walk along the trail as indicated by that arrow, if you stay in the middle of the trail, it's highly unlikely you'll come in contact with a tick. But as soon as you move off the trail into the grass, the picture at the top on the right is what's relevant because there can be a tick sitting there waiting for you. So where you go to in the outdoors, and you have to go outdoors to get exposed to this tick, but where you go to in the outdoors can greatly vary your risk of exposure to this tick. And just to remind you, they typically will attach to you somewhere between your knee and your ankle, usually halfway up. And I'll come back to that in a minute. I think one of the questions I often asked is what time of the year are we most likely to come in contact with ticks? If you've been out recently, you will know this time of the year is a risk time of the year. What I've shown you in this particular graph, and this particular graph um, is for the whole of 2014, this is all the ticks that were submitted to the Public Health Agency of Canada for the year 2014. This is all the deer ticks they they received and they've expressed for each month from left to right, from January to December, each bar indicates the percentage of all the ticks they received that year, the percentage of all the ticks that were detected in each month. You'll see there's a peak in May, typically, and there's another peak in October. So why the two peaks? The reason is freshly um, developed adult ticks, immature adults, appear in the environment August, September time, late summer, early fall. That's when immature adults first appear. And so that's why we detect them, them on ourselves in typically September, October, November, and even sometimes early December. So that's when the adults first appear on the environment. That's why we detect them in the fall. Where are the ones coming from that are in the environment now, April, May, June? The answer to that is all the ticks that developed into the environment in the fall if they didn't attach to a person or an animal, they literally survived the winter under the snow. And so the, the deer ticks, the adults that we see at this time of the year, those are the ones that have survived the entire winter under the snow. And so that's what we find feeding on ourselves at this time of the year. So there's two, two typical risk periods, April, May, June, and then October, November, December, when we are at risk of coming in contact with adult ticks, the deer tick. That's Another question for you here. Uh -huh. um, can the ticks, when they're attaching to you, can they jump or do you have to brush against them? So, the t no, that's a great question. Fleas, which I'm not talking about, but if you've got a dog or a cat, you've probably seen a flea. Fleas can jump and run really quickly. Ticks don't do either. They literally wait until you brush up against them, right? So they don't jump, they don't hunt you. They wait for you to come in contact with them and that's it. That's a great question. So just remember, you see deer ticks both at this time of the year and in the late fall. Um, but the other thing to appreciate at this time of the year, April, May, and June time, the other tick that you will commonly find on yourself is the American dog tick. So it's at this time of the year, April, May, June time, that if you see a tick, it could be either because both are in the environment. In the fall, 
99 times out of 100, the only tick you'll find on yourself at that time of the year is the deer tick. So there's much more of the year that we're at risk of contact with the deer tick. So just to remind you from those two arrows, those are the two peaks in risk of exposure to the deer tick. So next question, which actually partly relates to the question that I was just asked, what influences the risk of exposure to ticks? So as I mentioned, they do not come hunting for you, as in fact fleas will. They literally are in the environment staying still until we come in contact with them. Now I showed you this picture of a deer tick earlier on. Just to remind you, when immature adults are waiting to feed on us, they literally crawl blades of grass, all right? And then they sit there with the front legs, and I'm pointing to you there, pointing out, we use a term questing, it just means they're waiting for us to brush past them. So just remem remember, they wait for us. But the issue is, since the mid 1990s, the distribution of the deer tick has changed dramatically. Just to remind you, until the mid 1990s, the only place in all of Canada where the deer tick was believed to occur was Long Point on Lake Erie. It was in the years after that, many people across Canada started finding these ticks. And as a result of that, the Public Health Agency of Canada set up a monitoring system where essentially anyone across Canada could send them the ticks. And so they developed maps of where the ticks were found every year. And they were kind enough to send me the data for 2008. Right? So this is 2008, every red dot, indicates a deer tick that was submitted to them to that in that year. So you can appreciate by about 1995, the only place this tick was believed to occur was Long Point, all right? So this is about 10 years later. Where else are the ticks occurring? Well, you can see they're right throughout um, eastern, particularly eastern Ontario, across southern Quebec, throughout most of the maritime provinces, and then the other places, particularly the southern parts of Manitoba. Now, in many of these places, these ticks were, were found for the very first time in that area. And if you're ever in an area which never seen the tick before, you always must ask yourself, is this deer tick I found, is it what we call an adventitious tick? That means a tick that's dropped off a bird into the environment, or is that tick part of a rapidly breeding, happy population in the environment? And the reason it's important to differentiate those two is if it's a tick that's fed off a bird, it's very likely it actually won't establish in the environment. Many of them die off. However, if it represents an actively breeding population, that's a much greater concern. Let me just go back to that map just to point out this particular issue, all right? Hang on. So that's the same map. You see the arrows now pointing to one of the red dots in Alberta. And certainly in 2008, there was, and for the next good few years, there was no evidence this tick had established in that province. All right? The environment typically was very dry, which these ticks don't like. Each of the three Alberta ticks almost certainly was a tick that had dropped off um, a bird and it wasn't a significant concern. The much bigger concern is when there's evidence those ticks have established and are actively breeding in the environment. This is the Public Health Ontario map for what's called the risk areas for this tick in 2017. So these are not areas where the tick was found for the first time. These are areas that the public health agency and local public health units have gone out to once people have submitted a tick to them. And that's why I'd always encourage you to submit deer ticks to your local public health unit, particularly if it's a new area. They have now for many, a number of years had the funding to go into those areas. They literally drag cloth along the ground to look for the tick. And then to document it on this map, they go back the next year and drag in the same year area. And if they find the deer tick in the same area two years in a row, now they make the conclusion it's now happily breeding. And it's a much more of a concern for public and animal health. So this is what was called the Lyme disease risk map for Ontario 
for the year 2017. Just so that you know, you can get each of the year maps from the Public Health Ontario website. I've got both the 2018 and the 2019 maps. I'm going to show you um, to show you how things are changing. The 2020 map should be coming out any week now. So I just encourage you to go to their website in the next few weeks and you'll find the most recent risk map. So just remember the yellow areas on this map indicate areas where the deer tick, there's, there's clear evidence it's established and is happily breeding. So there's a few parts of Southern Ontario to appreciate. Number one, the arrow points to Long Point on Lake Erie, where most of you have concern. And as I said, that's the only place up until the mid 1990s where the deer tick occurred. It's after that the, the tick started establishing, particularly first in national parks along the northern shore of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And the reason it was those parks first is all associated with the migration of birds in the spring. Remember in the spring, large numbers of birds migrate up into Canada from the northeastern seaboard and the birds that fly across Lake Erie or Lake Ontario when they get across the lake, many of them land, assume it's to refuel, um, as birds do. So they land in the national parks and the ticks just drop off into those environments. So it was the national parks first, um, like Point Pelee, like Rondo, like Turkey Point, which was the first place these were found. But it's important to appreciate things are changing significantly in other areas as well. This circle shows you all of Eastern Ontario, um, and things have been changing quickest in that part of southern Ontario because essentially everything is perfect in the environment for the establishment and breeding of this tick. That shows you the risk map for 2017. Look at that area um, going forward, um, particularly first in this area. So um, in eastern Ontario, things have changed dramatically. I want to show you what essentially is the Greater Toronto area. And going out to Owen Sound and Aurelia. I'll come to Long Point area in a minute. You can see in 2017 there was just a small distribution from Mississauga to Pickering. That was new just in the just in the year or two before that. This is now 2018. So look inside the circle. I'll go back to 2017. Look at 2018. You can see the distributions now over the letters and YRK for the York area. There's also a distribution now just west of Aurelia. I'll go back to 2017, sorry, I'll go back to 2017, 2018, and then I'm gonna go forward now to 2019. You can see even there's more filling out within that circle in 2019. Let me just go back to 2017, 2018, 2019. You'll also see the distribution has spread right along the western shore of Lake Erie, uh, of Lake Ontario as well. Let me now come down to the area I think is of greatest concern to you, and that is Long Point and the Turkey Point area. There was always a distribution there um, that spread to Turkey Point um, in the late 1990s, and not a lot happened for many years, but look at what happened, number one, in 2018. So the difference between 2017 and 2018, there's now an area in the Hamilton area, that's 2018, but now look at the Turkey Point Long Point distribution, you can see that spread out. I'm gonna go back to 2018, 2019. You can see the area of the Niagara Peninsula area, 2018, 2019. I'm very interested to see the new map that's gonna be published for 2020, because I'm pretty suspicious much of the white area between the yellow areas in that circle likely have filled out. So things are changing quickly by the year as far as the distribution of this tick is concerned. So what's driving some of the changes? Well, I mentioned birds have been migrating from the northeastern seaboard of the US every spring and bringing ticks in. Now, many people say to me, yeah, but ticks have all, sorry, birds have always been migrating into Ontario every spring. That's true, right? But what has changed is the number of ticks and their distribution in the northeastern seaboard of the US. Just to show you how quickly things have been changing in the US over the last 20 years, this is the, Ly the human Lyme disease risk map for the US for the year 2001. Look in the northeastern seaboard, this particular area. So every blue dot 
is a diagnosed case of Lyme disease in a person in the US. And about 80% of all the Lyme cases in the US are, are in this region. It's why it has the name Lyme from Connecticut, but it's in other US states in that area as well. And about 80% of all the Lyme disease cases in the US come from this area. The other lesser risk area is just to the west of the Great Lakes, just there. So look at this area, the northeastern seaboard of the US for the year 2001. And then I'm going to take you forward straight to the year 2017. Let me go back to 2001 and then forward 16 years to the two, year 2017. You can see there's been a dramatic expansion in the area where cases of Lyme disease are being diagnosed in people. Both actually in the northeastern seaboard, look just to the west of the Great Lakes, all right, that's 2001, that's 2017. So there's been a sizable change in the distribution. Some people say, well, isn't that because of more testing? It certainly is in part, but that's not the only reason. There's been a lot more ticks established and there's more of the ticks are infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. And remember, every spring, large numbers of birds migrate into the US from the northeastern seaboard of the US. So why is the distribution of the tick changing? Bird migration certainly is playing a role, although birds have always migrated. But the risk of birds picking up ticks from the northeastern seaboard of the US has changed significantly in the last 20 years or so. The next thing to appreciate that in certain areas, the risk has changed because the deer population numbers have increased significantly in some areas. And in part, that's associated in some areas with reforestation. The other thing that's one of the major drivers for the change in distribution of the tick is climate change. Uh, and there's a lot of work that's been done on this issue by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And this is work that the Public Health Agency of Canada published in the year 2008. And what they've done in the maps I've gonna show you is look, look forward from the year 2000 to the year 2080 with respect to what's gonna to happen to the environment in Ontario and elsewhere in Canada with respect to its suitability for this tick. So what this map shows you is suitability, sorry, suitability of the climate, not the environment. Suitability of the climate, so that's humidity and temperature. And the most important thing to focus on is the red area. That indicates essentially perfect humidity and temperature for this tick. And so you can see if you look at that map for the year 2000, there's a very few numbers and small areas of red area, all right, where the climate is perfect for this tick. So the humidity and the temperature are perfect. If you then go forward to their prediction, so this was the prediction for the year 2020, this year, that's the climate suitability for the year 2020. Let me just go back. That's the year 2000. And this is back in 2008, what they predicted for this year, that's the distribution. Now, um, I, hopefully you can appreciate from what I've just so shown you, essentially the whole of Eastern Ontario and Southern Quebec is almost exactly as we're finding the tick now. If you go to the Southwestern part of Ontario, there's a lot of red. The reason the tick is not everywhere is that while the climate is suitable, the environment isn't suitable everywhere for this tick, but both the climate and the environment are suitable, certainly in the eastern half of Ontario. So that's the year 2020. Let me take you forward to the year 2050 and then the prediction for the year 2080. I'll just take you right back to the year 2000, 2020, 2050, 2080. These predictions for climate change are entirely consistent with almost all the models, and that is, over the coming years, the greatest changes in climate will occur in the central parts of the US rather than along the coastal areas. That's the prediction for what the environmental, I'm um, sorry, the climate suitability will be in the year 2080. Do you remember the tick won't be over the whole area because the environment needs to be suitable um, for the tick to spread as well but climate change is certainly one of the drivers for what we're seeing. So, following on from that, what evidence is there, in addition to the changes in the distribution of the tick, 
what evidence there is there that the risk of Lyme disease, the risk of you and your pets, uh, what's the evidence the risk of that is changing in the province? Fortunately, the Public Health Agency of Canada have shared with me the data they received on the basis of ticks that were sent to them from all over Ontario for the years 2007 to the year 2013. And this indicates how many deer ticks they received of cats, dogs, and people for each of those years. You can see at least 70% of all the ticks they received were off people. What's interesting is the next slide, because the next slide shows what happens when the Public Health Agency of Canada dissected the ticks and looked at them to see whether or not they were infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. And the next slide shows you a summary of what they found for the years 2017 going down to the year 2013. It's the column on the right that shows you how many, and within the brackets, the percentage of the ticks that were detected infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. Keep an eye on the figures inside the brackets because that tells you the percentage or the proportion of all the ticks that they detected infected. In the year 2007, just 7.5% of the ticks were detected infected. But if you go forward just three years to the year 2013, you can see that figure has crept up to 18.4%. So in the year 2013, just more than 18% of all the ticks were detected infected. And this is exactly what we expect to see in areas where this tick is new. Initially, only a low number of ticks are infected, but as the years progress, the proportion of infected ticks changes dramatically. So I'd give you some summary information that if you're traveling across Ontario, these are data just from a few years ago, so if anything, the figures would be a little bit higher now. But overall, if you traveled across Ontario and found a deer tick, as I've just shown you, the chance that it would be infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease is just over 18%. So on average, one in five is infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. If you travel across Canada and happen to be a, find a deer tick on you, the figure's almost exactly the same. However, if you tra chain travel to parts, particularly of Ontario, where the tick has been for significant periods, let me take you first to Point Pelee. This is in the year 2012. About 27% of the ticks were detected infected. But if you traveled to Long Point on Lake Erie, and this is back in 2009, so if anything, you'd expect the figure to be higher. But back in 2009, about 60% of the ticks on Long Point were detected infected. That's not surprising because I said earlier on, Long Point is where this tick has been longest as far as to where it's resided across Canada. So if you go to Long Point, there's essentially a 60% chance. So if you find two of these ticks on you or your pet, there's a, it's very likely one of them is infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. So last issue I just wanted to cover is what's the evidence that the risk of infection in people in Ontario is changing? I've shown you the distribution of the tick has been changing. I've told you that the risk of infection in ticks has been increasing. What's the evidence that the risk of Lyme disease in people um, has been changing? Before I give you the data that are available off the Public Health Ontario website, I thought I should first tell you a little bit about what happens with Lyme disease in people. So to get Lyme disease, you need to be fed on by a deer tick, and it needs to be well fed. And typically it needs to be attached for at least 36 to 48 hours before it can transmit the bug that causes Lyme disease into your skin. So what typically happens in people after an infected tick has fed on you? The, the answer is typically somewhere between 60 and 80% of people develop the skin rash that's shown on this slide. And it's classically, it's a very large red rash. You'll see in the textbook, sometimes it's referred to as a bullseye appearance. The reality is many human skin lesions, they don't look like a bullseye, they look like this essentially. It's red throughout. But there's two things, important things to appreciate that differentiates the skin lesion from a typical bug bite. The first thing is it usually develops seven to 14 days after the tick has started feeding. So that's unlike, you know, like a mosquito bite or another bug bite, where typically we develop skin lesions very quickly. This develops usually 7 to 14 days later. 
And the other thing that differentiates it from skin lesions for regular bug bites, classically these lesions are more than five centimeters in diameter. So that's the typical initial presentation, all right? And then after that, what then happens is that the bacteria spreads um, in the skin to elsewhere. Usually people um, develop flu-like signs, all right? Um, they may have um, aching joints in the local area over the next month. And then after that, the bacteria can spread around the body and cause a very severe disease. The important thing to note is if you are seen in the early stages of infection, so typically in the first month while you have a skin lesion or flu-like signs, that can be treated very typically very effectively with an antibiotic. And so the bottom line is if you're at all suspicious that that's what's happening, go to your physician and ask for them to look at you. Just be aware in Ontario, Lyme disease for the last few years has been a reportable disease. And that is legally physicians have to report it. All right, and in this slide I've indicated um, the three definitions of what are called confirmed cases. And whenever you go to a physician and there's any suspicion about Lyme disease, they should hold up to you the latest Lyme disease risk map for Ontario. So physicians just as vets, if there's any concern about Lyme disease, when you see them, they should be showing this map to you. And as they're talking to you, they should be asking, do you live in or do you travel into any of these areas? Particularly, have you been into any of these areas in the last month? All right, because that's part of the diagnostic process. Confirmed cases have to be reported. They also have what are called probable cases. All right, and for those, that's great because there isn't a need to have traveled into any of these areas for those cases to be reported which is great because we realize things are changing quickly and so none of the maps are completely up to date. So they have to legally report both confirmed cases and probable cases. And this shows you, I'm gonna show you some map data off the Public Health Ontario website. This is the number of reported cases of Lyme disease from the year 2005 to the year 2016. You can see that since roughly the year 2010, the number of human cases diagnosed in the province has been progressively increasing, just as it has been in parts of the northeastern seaboard of the US. It bounces up and down some years, and that's, for instance, the year 2014. It dropped because that was a much drier year, and the same thing was seen in parts of the northeastern US, but there's a gradual change of increased risk of people um, developing Lyme disease. The other thing that's very interesting off the Public Health Ontario website is this bar graph that indicates how many cases of human Lyme disease were diagnosed by physicians in each month of the year. So it goes from January to December, this is for the year 2014, and the higher the bar graph, the greater the number of human cases that were diagnosed each month. If I was in a room with you, I'd ask you, which of the two months of the year most of the human cases of Lyme disease are being diagnosed? Hopefully you'll appreciate the answer is June, in July. That's when most people are getting diagnosed with Lyme disease by their physicians. Most people are diagnosed with the skin rash, so the early stage of infection. So that's infection that's occurred within the previous month. So this is the time of the year when you're most likely to get infected. The cases being diagnosed in June typically are being acquired in May. That's when the tick fed on them. The cases being diagnosed by physicians in July typically ticks in the environment this month. So it's now is when you're at greatest risk coming into contact with ticks and getting diagnosed with Lyme disease. So just like all the vet students I teach, I was gonna give you a final exam um, <laughs> with some pictures and ask you some questions about these ticks. And this is, but I'll, we'll do it together with me talking along, but feel free to ask any questions. If I showed you this image of a tick removed off a person and asked you, will you or your dog get Lyme disease? The first question always to ask is, number one, is it the deer tick? All right, hopefully you can appreciate if you look at the plate behind the mouth parts, right, it's all dark brown. Hopefully you can appreciate this tick is well fed. So the important facts to appreciate if you're trying to ask, answer the question, Will I get Lyme disease from this tick? Right, number one, is it the right tick? Is it a deer tick? And the other thing that's very important, is it well fed? This is just to remind you that for the tick to transmit the bug that causes Lyme disease into you or your pet, 
it needs to have been attached to you or your pet for at least 36 hours before the bug can be transmitted to you. This is a graph at the bottom. It goes from zero to 96 hours or one, two, three, four days. Uh, and as you go to the right, all right, as you go beyond 24 hours, the risk of the tick transmitting the bug to you starts increasing. But it's really at least 36 to 48 hours before there's any significant risk of the tick transmitting the bug to you, which is why if you check yourself daily for ticks, you will always pull them off yourself or your pet before there's any chance they could have transmitted the bug that causes Lyme disease. The last thing to remember is what's the risk the tick could even be infected if it's the right tick and it's fed long enough. Overall, the figure is about 18 to 20 percent in Ontario. But remember, if you're in Long Point, there's about a 60 percent chance that tick could be infected. So, um, sorry, yes. before you take a step there, we've got a couple of good questions coming in the chat. Um, Marianne would like to know if anything can be done to affect the tick populations. That's a good question. Can anything be done to affect the tick populations? I mean, the, the, re, the reality is unless you change the, the, the natural environment in which they occur, all right, they, they will establish. Now, I know some people who have yards that back on um, to deciduous forest areas. If you keep the grass in that garden short, all right, you essentially will minimize the risk of the ticks being able to move onto your property um, and survive. So the reality is unless you change the ticks environment dramatically, which is obviously going to have a big environmental impact and an impact on multiple things, um, you essentially can't. But there are things you can do that I was going to mention in the next two slides that can minimize the risk of you or your dogs getting Lyme disease. Joel, was there another question? Yes. Um, someone says, I've been told that ticks can drop down on you from overhanging branches of shrubs or trees. Is that true? So I've heard that. So it I think it depends on the height of the shrub or the tree. Um, typically, once you get more than probably two, three foot high, typically ticks will never climb. They typically won't climb much higher than about a foot. So the stories of ticks dropping out of trees from high heights, there's, there's no significant evidence that that occurs more than rarely. I mean, I, I've given up saying things never happen. And there's probably a wacky tick every now and again that doesn't, doesn't read the textbooks. But if it does occur, it's extremely rare. Yeah. And then one last question. Um, how does the tick actually transmit the bacteria into people or animals? That's a great qu question. How does the tick transmit the bacteria um, into animals or people? The reason, so the reason the tick has to have been feeding for at least 36 hours before it can transmit the bug that causes a Lyme disease is that when it first gets infected, so it's fed on an infected mouse, it's ingested the blood with the bacteria, the bacteria stays in the gut. But when the next life cycle stage starts feeding on its blood meal, at that point, the bacteria is stimulated to migrate to the salivary gland. So it's a structure around the mouth parts. And at that point, once the bacteria is in the salivary gland around the mouth parts, when it feeds, the bacteria goes in during the feeding process. So that's a, it's interesting. It's unusual that bugs take a long time after the ticks attach before they can be transmitted. Lyme disease is highly unusual, but it's why checking yourself for ticks every 24 hours is a great way of essentially eliminating the risk of this disease. Joel, was that every question? Yes, for now. Okay. Thank you. So let's first talk about dogs. If I asked you how many of you have dogs, I think probably somewhere between a third and a half of you likely have a dog. All right. So we have far more options to stop our dogs getting um, Lyme disease. And always the first recommendation is if you have any concern about Lyme disease, go and talk to your veterinarian. Excuse me, they will know what the tick risk is in your area and where you travel to with your dog. And vets have lots of good tick products that can be, for instance, applied to the skin of your dog, um, that can be given orally to the dogs. And most of them last a month. 
uh, and then you just keep applying the product, most of them, on a monthly basis. So we have lots of very good tick products for our dogs. If there is significant risk or concern about Lyme disease, we also have a number of Lyme vaccines for dogs. All right, and so particularly if, if you're living, for instance, near the Long Point area, I think most vets certainly would recommend a tick product and likely would recommend a Lyme vaccine in addition to that. Just note, unfortunately, we do not have any Lyme vaccines for people. There is a lot of work going on in that area at the moment because there is a very big market. The other thing just to re remember with your dog, if there's any concern about this tick and Lyme disease, irrespective of whether you're using tick product or vaccination, you should always, for instance, at this time of the year, check your dog daily, all right, to see if it has any ticks on it. The image on the right just helps, um, oops, helps tell you if a tick is at attached, all right, whether like this tick, it's only just started feeding or not. If you're comfortable removing the tick off either the pet or yourself, you grab it by the mouth parts right beside the skin and pull out slowly. If you're not comfortable with doing that with your dog, take the dog to your vet. If you're not comfortable doing it with yourself, go to your physician or your local public health unit. So what can you do for yourself? And do remember, if there's a risk of ticks and Lyme disease with your dog, if you're with your dog when it goes for walks or hiking, you're equally at risk. So what can you do to prevent the risk of Lyme disease? Number one, do recognize it, this is all driven by where you go walking. Are you going into areas where this tick occurs? So just remember, if, for instance, if you're in a downtown urban area, a parking lot, there is no risk of this tick. You've got to go into suitable environments, as I said, inside on the edge of deciduous forests are the greatest risk areas. And when you go into those risk areas, just remember the ticks usually are gonna to try to attach to you when you walk past them in the grass and they usually will attach below your knee height, somewhere between your knee and your ankle height. So be careful when you're walking in woods. I could tell you just don't go hiking, but I mean, that's, that's a ridiculous thing. We've got to learn to live with these ticks as they have, for instance, in the Connecticut area for many, for many years. So the recommendation at this time of the year is, is at all possible if you're going hiking in a tick environment, ideally wear long pants and tuck them into your socks. The reason is if you're wearing long pants, the tick can't attach straight onto your skin. It will attach to your pants somewhere between the knee and ankle, and then it will crawl up your pants because it's on the outside hoping to get to your skin. And the recommendation also is ideally wear long sleeve shirts, particularly if you're lying in the bush, for instance, bird watching. Again, you're trying to reduce the risk of the tick attaching to your skin, which is, and so it's increasing the chance that you will see the tick before it attaches to you. Just be aware, the reality is, at this time of the year, many people don't want to wear long pants. What would happen if you just go out with shorts, well, the, or, or short pants? The reality is the ticks typically They'll attach to our legs, and then usually they do not start feeding at that location. They usually crawl upwards, and they usually um, start, they attach and start feeding. I'm gonna have to tell you these areas. It's usually the waist area, the groin area, or the back of the, the hairline. Those are the areas typically the ticks are trying to get to the environment's best, and that's where they will start feeding. If you spray your skin with a DEET containing product, it acts as a repellent, which means when you walk through the bush, as you walk past a tick that's lying on the blade of grass with its legs out, it literally won't attach to you. That's what the DEET is stopping it doing. If you're wearing long pants, usually the recommendation is spray the lower parts of your long pants with DEET because it will stop the ticks attaching onto your pants. And then the other recommendation is if you're checking your dog every day for ticks, you should be checking yourself for ticks. And as I said, if you do that every day, you will pick off the ticks. Even if they've attached, they won't have been attached long enough to transmit the bug that causes Lyme disease. When they're, they're not particularly big in the first 24 hours, and as I said, the places you're most likely to find them, the groin, around the waist, also the armpits, and around the scalp. If they're attached, that picture just shows you 
how to pull them off just carefully. Now, as I said, if you're uncomfortable doing that with yourself or your dog, go to your physician or your vet. So I'm going to finish uh, wait, with... Yes. Oh, sorry, if you're just about to finish, then you go ahead. We've got a few more questions rolling in, but they weren't specifically related to that. So I, I'm just going to give a final exam. Yep, you do that. And then I'm we'll, we'll a final exam. I can't actually ask you directly. So I'm going to show you some pictures and I'm going to ask you if this was you, you pulled this off yourself or your dog, will you or your dog get Lyme disease? First one, the first one I'm going to show you is a picture that was sent to me last Sunday from a vet in Toronto who found this literally on his waist under his pants. He panicked and he literally sent me this cell phone picture and he said to me, am I going to get Lyme disease? Which was a bit embarrassing because the vet should have been able to recognize this. But anyway, so I'm going to ask you, if you saw this, you pulled it off yourself, will you get Lyme disease? So hopefully you can appreciate if you look at the plate behind the head, it's multicolored. It's multicolored. So it can't be the deer tick, all right? It's the American dog tick. So I immediately got back and said, there's no risk whatsoever, it's the wrong tick. The other thing just to appreciate, it's not even fed as well, all right? So it's not fed, it's not the deer tick. So there's no risk of Lyme disease at all with that tick. Are you ready for the next one? Will you get Lyme disease from this tick? So again, the answer's no. But is this the same or a different tick? If you look at the plate behind the head, it's all dark brown. This is the deer tick. Why is there no risk of Lyme disease? Because this tick's not fed. It's not even attached. All right. So it's the right tick, but it's not even fed. Last picture. Will you get Lyme disease if you pull this tick off yourself or your, or your dog? Will it get Lyme disease? I've sort of given you some of the answer to this. Again, look at the plate behind the mouth parts. You can see it's all dark brown. Has to be the deer tick. So it's the right tick. Next question, has it fed long enough that if it's infected, it's able to transmit the bug? Absolutely, it's extremely well fed. All right, so it's the right tick, it's fed long enough. Overall in this province, what's the chance it's infected? About 20%, but if, it's from, if you're in long point, all right, and you've pulled this off, there's about a 60% chance historically that it's infected. So there's a significant risk. So if you have a tick like this, if it's off yourself, go to your physician, ideally with the tick or your public health unit. If you've pulled this off your dog, go with your dog to your vet and they'll talk to you about management. So hopefully that's um, given you an update on what's happening, have been happening. Hopefully I've indicated how things are changing and likely will change over the coming years. Hopefully you appreciate that your risk of exposure depends on what you do every day with your dog or by yourself in the environment. But hopefully you appreciate there's a number of things when you go out into the environment every day, you can do to reduce the risk of ticks attaching to you and getting Lyme disease, both for yourself and your dog. I'd just like to thank all these people that shared data um, for this presentation. Uh, and lastly, Joel, that was me finished. So, um, thanks everyone for listening. Um, particularly online like this. I hope it was informative um, and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you, Andrew. That was absolutely fantastic. So, so much information there. Um, and really, really great and well explained as well. So lots of questions coming in. Um, here's one. Uh, do they mainly wait on grasses or can they also be found on things like ferns or other vegetation? It I mean, it, usually it's on grasses, right? But I, you know, on the edge of a grassy area, which is a suitable habitat for ticks, you might occasionally find one, all right? Again, it's, it's not clear cut, but the majority will be in, in grassy areas on the edge of deciduous forests. Okay, here's another one. Uh, my pup was di just diagnosed with Lyme. She was treated with prevention last August and September and was going to start prevention this spring when the diagnosis was made. Should we have been giving monthly protection for the entire year? Hmm. So, so the question is, should the dog have been on monthly protection throughout the year? Yes, um, throughout the entire year. That, so so the, the whole question is, how much of the year are you or your dog at risk of infection? I mean, the answer to that is, it depends on the area where you are in southern Ontario. And that's why you really need to talk to your vet or your local public health unit to be up to date with what's happening. As far as certainly as humans are concerned, I know I mentioned, do you remember, uh, let me 
if I can I just go back a little way sorry folks this is I wanted to show you the map of when we find adult ticks sorry when we find adult ticks in the environment um, geez it's here so do you remember this map I sh whoops so do you remember this was the when in the year we find adult ticks in the environment and I said there's usually a peak number in May whoops and there's another peak in October November that's when we find adults the reality is nymphs in the environment occur in the months in between and so we typically recommend for dogs to have them on prevention right from early April to at least the end of November however things are changing all right and there's a few practices in southern Ontario have started seeing ticks during the winter months and as we go forward and climate change changes things more profoundly I think many of us with dogs are going to switch um, to using tick prevention year-round we historically have tried not to do that until there's a need because we don't want to make we don't want to make the ticks resistant to the products we use for tick control so the bottom line is talk to your vet about what's happening in their area and also don't forget to tell your vet where you travel to every year with your pets okay great uh, here's another one can they feed through clothes so can they feed can they feed through clothes it's very rare that, that will happen like very rare they that that's so that's usually why when they attach to your pants they just keep crawling upwards because they're they're looking for bare skin to feed makes sense um a question does the new clothing advertised by marks work i guess i'm assuming this is uh pyrethrin treated clothing i don't know so for sure. so i sorry i don't know the specifics um of those clothes um, one, one of the things, just again, find out what they're using in the clothes, all right, that's the tick repellent. Find out how long lasting um, it is, um, just, to, just to be careful with that. One, one thing to be particularly careful with, with respect to spraying ourselves in the environment, there is a tick product that the drug is called permethrin. It's called permethrin. It's in some tick products that you can buy over the counter, so not from your vet. You can buy over the counter, like in Walmart, for your dog. You should only ever give it to your dog um, if you do not have a cat in your environment. So you should not be using permethrin on your dog or yourself if you have cats in the same environment. Permethrin is very toxic for cats. So just be careful with that one. As far as what's in these clothes, I don't want, know what it is. I suspect it's something like one of the natural insecticides called pyrethrin. You just need to find out how long lasting that is, if that's what they're saying is in the products. Uh, she is updated and saying that it, it is permethrin that's in the marks, on the, in the marks clothing. It's in permethrin. Is, it does, sorry, Joel, did you say permethrin? She said permethrin. Yeah, I know there's, there's a difference between permethrin and pyrethrin. I, I so, if, so I know, for instance, I know the... <laughs> I know the arm, Canadian Army, if they're training in tick areas, they typically um, impregnate the army clothes with permethrin. It's a very, very good tick product, and it's pretty residual for a few weeks on clothes. As I said, I would, it works well, but don't use it if you have a cat in your environment, because if the cat licks it, you can literally end up with a cat being not only very serious, it often will kill cats. So just be careful. That's a great tick. Uh, tip, tick, huh, it's funny. Um, another question, what do male ticks feed on? So they feed, they actually feed on blood. Um, they are much, much smaller. Actually, I'll, I can show you a picture. Sorry folks, it's, this was right back at the beginning. Remember that picture I showed you? The tick on the right is a female tick. That's why she's expanded dramatically. If you look to the left of that image, that's actually a male tick. It's upside down, all right? Um, but it's actually feeding on blood as well. They don't enlarge, so we rarely ever see them. It's much easier to detect ticks that are well-fed. Okay, uh, here's another one. Um, is there ever a chance or risk in the future of the dog tick transmitting Lyme disease? 
so the answer so the answer to that is no there's no evidence that the dog tick can can transmit Lyme disease what I didn't tell you do you remember right back at the beginning I showed you this table of all the ticks that you can find on dogs and people in North America I said that currently the only two ticks we have are the deer tick and the American dog tick what I forgot to tell you was the general feeling is within the next five to ten years we are very likely to start seeing the tick at the top of that list appear establishing in Ontario, the Lone Star tick. And all the evidence is that's going to be the next tick that comes into Ontario. It's called the Lone Star tick, so you would have thought it's just in Texas. The reality is over the last 20, 30 years, it's spread right up the eastern seaboard of the US. It's now present in New York State. And the reason it's a concern is it transmits a number of bugs that infect both dogs and people. So there's really no concern from the American dog tick. Going forward, the concern actually is the Lone Star tick bringing in a few bugs that can infect people. So the public health units are watching for the Lone Star tick now going forward. And, um Catherine uh, has said, someone says, I have removed a Lone Star tick from a person in Mississauga in May 2018. Yes. So, uh, and so I, have, I have dealt with a few dogs, actually one in the Oakville area, one in the Greater Toronto area, Lone Star ticks. Just like, you remember I told you when we first start seeing deer ticks in a new area, the question is, is that one, for instance, that's just dropped off a bird or is it now representative of an actively breeding population? Today, to date, all the Lone Star ticks, and it's consistent with what you just said, they're individual ticks in an area. Again, the first question always to ask is, have you traveled in within the previous week? So could you have brought it from elsewhere? If not, it's most likely that's just a, a one that's dropped off a bird and not recently and not established. So when, I, when this occurs, I always tell vets, keep a record of that tick in your area. And the most important thing to ask is, is the same tick detected the following area in the, sorry, the following year in the same area? And to date, I've never heard of that. They've just been individual Lone Star ticks and going the next few years, no one's found another one in the same area. That's gonna change. I'm waiting for the first phone call, probably within the next five years, that people are gonna have evidence that a Lone Star tick is being found in the same area two years in a row. So I think watch this space, keep an eye on the Public Health Ontario website because they'll report it definitely. Okay, great. Um, I think we have time for a few more questions. Here's another one. Um, how close are we to getting a human vaccine for this disease? So I, I don't know the answer to that. I do know, well, until COVID-19 came along, I know, knew all the companies what, that have dog vaccines and others are doing a lot of work to try and get a vaccine for humans on the market. I suspect with what's happening with COVID-19 vaccine development at the moment, their efforts have switched to that. I think once we have a vaccine for COVID-19, their focus will be back on a vaccine for Lyme disease. It's urgently needed because I think it would make many of us much more comfortable going out into deer ticks and environment if we've been vaccinated for this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how long can a tick survive without a food source, like in my car? So in your car, probably not for more than a day or two, because in the car environment, the humidity and temperature, is, particularly the humidity, is not appropriate. But in the right outdoor environment, they can survive for many months. As I said, you know, adult ticks typically appear September, October time, and if they don't feed, they can survive typically the whole Canadian winter under snow um, and then reappear for the following spring. So it just depends on the environment. If it's not a good environment, like indoors, for instance, they won't survive more than a day or two. But in, in an appropriate outdoor environment, many, potentially many months. Okay. Um, how can people be tested for Lyme disease in Ontario? How accurate are the tests? So that's a very good question. Um, the public health community, certainly in the last, I think the last seven to eight years, um, have developed protocols that are entirely consistent with what are recommended um, by um, infectious disease experts in the US. So they follow the same protocols and the same testing 
that's carried out in the US. And there's a number of different tests that are done with people. So there's multiple tests, there's at least two tests that are done on people. Today, those tests are extremely good and reliable. Um, I would just mention, just be careful if you go outside the province, there are some labs in the US that are not accredited. So you have no idea about the reliability of the data. And so people who've gone into the US historically uh, and got tested by labs were getting different data than what they were getting here. Part of that it certainly has been because there are some labs in the US that can make money from selling tests, even though they're not accredited. So you don't know the performance. But certainly over the, at least the last five to eight years in Ontario, we, the, the medical community has been using the same tests that are recommended in the US, and they regularly ensure that the tests are working as well as in the accredited labs in the US. That's people. In dogs, we use just one test. Is it true that cats do not get Lyme disease? So it's, so it's, tr it's true that disease, so that's animals becoming sick, is really not recognized in cats. And so I need to just differentiate. It's very true. It's true you will find deer ticks on cats if the cat goes outside. And it's true that deer ticks will feed on cats just as they will feed on dogs and people. And it's true that the ticks will transmit the bug that causes Lyme disease into cats. However, unlike dogs and people, there's almost no evidence that an infected cat ever becomes sick. So cats seem to be really resistant to infection. They'll get the bug, but they develop strong immunity. Dogs, we think about five to 10% of the dogs that get infected that ever become sick. So most dogs get infected but never become sick. People are completely different. Most people that get, get infected become sick. So cats, there's no recognition of cats becoming sick, but they can get infected with the bug. Okay, um, just a couple more questions here. Um, how long does the Lone Star tick need to be attached before transmitting disease? So it depends on the bug. But most, so most of the other tick-borne diseases are transmitted much quicker, much quicker than, tw for instance, 24 hours. And that's why there'll be, there'll be very different education that comes along if the Lone Star tick establishes here. Although I said it will, we think it's going to establish, we don't think it's going to take off to the extent the deer tick has. Like it likely will establish at low numbers. But I mean, we'd have to watch this space, but transmit infections much quicker, but it doesn't, it's not involved in Lyme disease risk. Okay. Um, is transmission with a male tick uh, less than a female one? It's thought males play a much, much lesser role in transmission than female ticks. And then uh, last question, what other symptoms of Lyme disease do people show? So, as I mentioned, the, the most common clinical signs is that skin rash. Um, and as I said, that typically occurs within, within 60 to 80 percent. So there's, there's at least 20 percent of people never develop skin lesion. After that, the, back, so, and the bacteria starts spreading um, through the skin, so to the joints. So sometimes people develop aching in their joints or flu-like signs. So the aching joints, feeling unwell, feeling as though you have flu, that all happens typically in the first month. So the skin lesions typically develop one to two weeks after a tick is fed. And then in the next two to three weeks, people develop flu-like signs, joint ache. And so for instance, if you develop that in the middle of the summer, it's not usually likely that's flu, all right? So if you develop any of those clinical signs, especially at this time of year, particularly though if you have a skin rash, take a picture of it um, with your camera with a measuring device by it. So even if you can't get to the physician for a day or two, you've still got evidence about the size of the lesion when you get to um, the physician. In some people, if the bacteria progresses more than a month, it can spread to places like the heart, to the brain and other locations, and it can cause significant disease. It's not common, but it does occur. The thing to note is if you go in the early stages of infection within the first month, just as in dogs, it responds very readily to antibiotic treatment. Typically, it's after it progresses elsewhere around the body, it can be more difficult to treat.
Okay, great. And uh, while Kristen uh, hops back on here, um, what, I guess one last question just came in. Where is the list of accredited labs? Uh, I don't have that. I would suggest you contact your local public health unit. Okay. Uh, now, Kristen, do you have anything to add? Oh, sorry, I'm a bit dark there. So thank you everyone for, for joining us. And thank you, Andrew, for a fantastic and very informative talk. I, I learned a lot uh, and I'm sure everyone else on, on the presentation tonight did as well. So thank you. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, for those of you who joined late, there, this was a recorded presentation. So there will be a video available in the near future, which we will to email to everyone who registered. It will also be available on our website. So again, thank you for, for a fantastic talk and thank you for everyone joining us. No, thanks folks for your questions. Great. Well, everyone stay safe and, uh, and look for that email in your inbox.